Hello everybody and thank you for joining. My name is Alex Ridgway and today I am going to be discussing shoeing for asymmetry. Uh, what is asymmetry? Um, what causes it? And how we as farriers um, are able to manage asymmetries. Okay, so let's jump. Okay, so what is a symmetry before we actually start talking about shoeing for it. Um, well, if we look closely enough, we will often see asymmetries in a lot more horses or animals that we think we actually do. And if we were to then begin measuring every foot that we picked up, um, I would imagine that we would probably realize that asymmetries uh, would be in some degree the actual normal. We would see it a lot more than we think we do and, and working in the thoroughbred industry I can certainly say that the majority or a vast majority of horses that I see um, to some degree would have a level of asymmetry. Um, it has often been linked to uh, grazing preferences as, as, as young animals, um, horses tending to load one limb more than the other, um, handedness similar to 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 um, to ourselves as humans, uh, being either right-handed or left-handed, um, or and, and and often it can be congenital, so an asymmetry that was acquired through through breeding, um, or acquired um, throughout the animal's life, um, and that can be you know we'll talk about these a little bit later on, but you know injuries um, or particular training regime, so. Um, and when I, when I talk about injuries, often we're, we're looking at uneven weight distribution as a result of an injury um, for possibly extended periods of time. Um, you know, direct traumas that, uh, from a kick or uh, muscle development asymmetries through, as I said, training regimes, riding styles, lameness, you know, both acute and chronic. And I suppose the list, the list goes on. Uh, Asymmetry is, is really the uh, mismatching of contralateral feet, so uh, feet uh, opposite feet, um, and it results in a flatter, lower heeled hoof and a more upright, high heeled hoof. And you can quite clearly see that in the uh, the pictures that we've got here on the screen, uh, that right fore being much lower heeled than the left fore. I think this animal was um, not long shod, so we're probably seeing it halfway through the shoeing cycle um, but you can quite clearly see the difference in the contralateral limbs um, and, and and note that we are referring to in this picture you know is looking from the sort of palmer aspect um, that we're referring to the height of the heels and not necessarily the angle of the toe um, there's a there's a great quote on the on the on the slide there from Dr. Rick Redden that the heel is as much part of the identification of the hoof as the toe, and the farrier can deal with the toe angle simply with a rasp and can change it drastically. But you don't change that relationship between the heel bulb and the heel angle much. And I think that's, um, you know, it's a very valid and very true point. Um, and again, this picture sort of sums that up quite nicely. So thoughts around asymmetry. So what has been the common thoughts around hoof asymmetries? So five, I would say five to sort of 10 years ago, it was probably common practice to try and make asymmetrical feet look a pair whether that's through trimming uh, or shoeing shoeing them as a pair and this was mainly uh, for aesthetics reasons so how those feet looked how they were presented um, and depending on the discipline or depending on um, you know that that the, the, the depending on the job of the equine um, you know really dictated how much emphasis was placed on making those feet look a pair and it is undoubtedly caused by sort of client owner uh, trainer um, pressure and i can probably say that this is still often a thought or a variable that we have to manage when dealing with these types of horses 
Um, however, with improvements in research uh, and science-based farriery and the development in trimming and, and or better trimming and shoeing protocols over recent years, thankfully that line of thinking has um, you know, drifted away or changed to treating the individual foot rather than um, trying to force them to be a pair. So when managing asymmetries, we must think of the dynamic aspect, especially in top performing uh, animals such as racehorses, jumpers, uh, dressage horses, etc. So we must therefore consider not only the support element of the trim and shoeing application, but also um, the suspension and the biomechanics of the hoof, uh, limb, and ultimately that um, that interaction with the ground, so that hoof, limb, and ground uh, relationship, and and obviously the the entire animal and how it's put together, and 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 basically that full understanding of conformation and um, you know the assessments that we take, both static and dynamic. Um, you know, incredibly important for that. Okay. So I'm not 100% sure where this uh, image on the right hand side has come from. I think it's possibly one of uh, Dr. Redden's images. It might well be, um, but it was recently shared by Rudin Riddle Equine Podiatry. And I thought it was a brilliant image to um, try and explain what's happening when we consider hoof asymmetries. The hoof has, uh, and, it's, and it's labeled there in yellow and green, the hoof has two main structural systems that work together exceptionally well. Um, these two systems are both the support system and the suspension system. So the support system being, um, being that of the hoof capsule, the sole, um, the frog, um, the frog, the bars and the digital cushion. Um, and you can see that in this image in the green with the little coil springs under the coffin bone around the sole um, and those shock absorbers in the palmar aspect making up that digital cushion. So when we then consider the suspension system, um, you know, this is where our sort of functional anatomy sort of comes into it. Um, we're looking at the, um, the, the deep digital flexor tendon uh, as it comes down the back of the leg um, under that navicular apparatus there and inserting onto the pedal bone and also the laminal bond between the coffin bone and the hoof wall. And it's that laminal bond being the main antagonist component to that pull from the deep digital flexor tendon, which, as I said, which travels over the navicular bone acting as that fulcrum point. Uh, and finally, and certainly on the base of the pedal bone. And it's this flexor tendon's attachment um, to the associated muscle uh, proximal to the, to the foot we're talking now. Um, so attachment to that deep flexor muscle up around the back of the forearm. Um, and the, if the muscles are designed to contract, um, you know, muscles cannot push, um, they can contract. And ultimately, when they're contracting, they're pulling on that tendon. And this deep digital flexor tendon therefore uh, exerts a, a rotational force on the coffin bone around that um, distal interphalangeal joint or that, that coffin joint um, or as that pedal bone articulates around that distal condyle of the middle phalanx there. Again, this, this image brilliantly illustrates that with the, um, the red arrows that you can see. You can see the descending body weight coming through the middle phalanx. Um, We've got the pull of the deep digital flexor tendon here, and you can see that you then get this rotational um, rotational force of that coffin joint around this um, center of rotation point or this um, this point in the distal condyle of P2. So when dealing with hoof asymmetries, it's only one side of the story uh, when we are considering the support apparatus with bar shoes, pads, and solar packing, um, there is this incredible force also at pl play. And we, and we must consider this force when determining the appropriate protocols. 
Okay, so to evaluate the horse uh, in order to determine a symmetry, you must perform uh, an evaluation both sort of statically and dynamically. And it, at the reasons we've discussed previously, you know, in the static phase, we can certainly look for the support mechanism or that support structure. Um, and we must also um, consider that for the suspension um, mechanism or that suspension system. And to do that, we need to see that animal move. We need to be uh, performing that dynamic examination. So when we're looking for or uh, when we're performing a static assessment, we want to make sure that animal is standing on a sort of firm and flat ground. And we want to be viewing it from the side in order to assess sort of hoof past an axis. Um, the position of, uh, of, the, of, of the limbs, both forelimb and hind limb, overall conformation, overall posture. Um, we're looking at heel height, toe height. We're looking at hoof geometry. Um, but some of those things, what, what we are picking up on from that um, lateral aspect is, and I said it before, the, that, that hoof past an axis, whether it's a broken forward or a straight hoof past an axis, potentially on the high heel foot, which may indicate a flexural deformity or a, uh, a grade f uh, of club foot. Whether we've got a broken back or straight hoof past an axis uh, on the low heel foot and assess heel height from the back, also noting the position and health of the frog. So, so when we are performing that um, static examination, and I said we'll be performing it from the lateral aspect for looking for that angle of the hoof past an axis there, um, from the dorsal aspect or from a frontal view, um, like you can see on the image on the middle here, and then also from a palmer or from a um, yeah, from a from a heel view, um, in order to determine, um, as I said, the, the height of those heels and also the, the position and condition of that frog and they are very important when we come to how we uh, how we shoe this animal uh, that we will talk about a little bit later on okay so um, as I said we then from a static examination we must go into the dynamic examination and evaluating the animal then both at walk and trot allows us to determine uh, a the landing pattern of the foot uh, and occasionally you will witness a slightly shorter stride length on the upright foot or the high heel foot. Um, as we get that increase in time that that contralateral limb uh, is on the ground. Uh, you should also perform um, a dynamic assessment in order to rule out any possible lameness as a result of um, asymmetries. And it's important to note this shortened stride length as that will give you a uh, well, lot um, it's important to notice that shortened stride length as you will uh, that you will observe on the high heeled hoof as this will often result in the low heeled foot being loaded for an extended period of time and it's it's this loading of the the flatter foot and this sort of gradual progression um, to being that um, low low heel, low, um, low hoof angled foot that you could be p uh, predisposing to uh, other pathologies. Um, okay. So some of the um, characteristic signs you would be noticing um, for hoof asymmetries would be uh, as follows really. So we've got sort of hoof height disparity. So one hoof taller than the other, often a very clear um, telltale sign. Uh, hoof angle differences. So this could range from a very mild difference to a very major difference. And it has links to flexural limb deformities, uh, especially of the coffin joint, um, also known as club foot. And we will look at the grades of club foot uh, a little later in this presentation. Some other signs that we'll be seeing are sort of sole or bruising, uh, especially around that dorsal distal tip of P3. Uh, and you would tend to normally see that in the higher, higher, more upright foot and often more heel bruising or corn development in the flatter, lower heeled hoof. So we're going to be seeing bruising in the C to corn region uh, a lot more in the flatter, lower heeled hoof. 
some other signs that we're going to be seeing is excessive toe wear uh, if 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 the horse is barefoot uh, or even excessive wear to the toe margin of any applied shoe um, some often display little to no wear at all at the heel area um, of the shoe but nearly near on wear out the toe um, of the shoe um, so you see in this real difference in um, shoe wear patterns uh, often it's interesting to note the junction between the frog and the hairline and it's identified in these images below with these little red circles here and if you were to draw it's believed that if you were to draw a line uh, or an imaginary line, line from that point to the apex of the frog that would give you an, an estimate or an approximate position or, or angle of P3 or that palmar angle of P3 there. Again, another thing you would see is a flattening of the sole. Um, and that's in both both feet, uh, in my in my experience, um, both in the, obviously the flatter foot, um, but also in the um, in the higher heeled hoof, and especially again around that dorsal region, uh, a flattening and a thinning of the sole. Um, and we often also experience the dishing of the hoof wall uh, as a result of that suspension mechanism. And this is a, a an example where we've um, we've been able to capture a before and after um, whilst using the, the Metron system. Uh, and what this was trying to show is when we do get that dished hoof wall, often it can be in both, uh, but more commonly in the high heeled hoof. Um, but what actually creates that dish? Um, I know we've mentioned the this um, the suspension mechanism, and it is that pull. Of the deep digital flexor tendon that is resisted by uh, the toe and the ground um, so ultimately that pressure is then placed upon that laminal interface that laminal bond between the pedal bone and the hoof wall and over time this leads to a slow remodeling of that pedal bone um, and can also result in slight rotation uh, within the hoof capsule so often the hoof wall becomes damaged around the toe region due to a lack of growth uh, and increased weight bearing responsibilities. Um, this makes continued chewing very difficult, added with a flattening or prolapsing of the sole uh, with little to no vertical depth. And you can see it in this top left image here, especially where that nail region is, how that hoof is becoming uh, extremely um, poor quality now. We have multiple nail holes. We're not getting any uh, vertical depth of foot here. These old nail holes are not growing out. So we can tell that this, this, this horse is not growing a great deal of foot. And you can also see these growth lines as they come back towards the heel. And we have a greater uh, d distance between the two than what we do up here. Uh, similar to what you would see in a chronic laminetic foot where we have the diverging growth rings and we're seeing that here with this particular horse um, this case was uh, we opted to um, to go with a slightly graduated 3d printed pad um, with the added uh, benefit of using dental impression material in the palmer half of the foot and you can see the the pink dental impression material coming through this this pad here um, these are brilliant these 3d printed pads there's not a great deal of weight in these pads they're, they're incredibly lightweight um, I think they have a couple of millimeters of solid material and then the rest of it is is like a honeycomb um, um, nylon material so it's incredibly lightweight and it's perfect for you know especially when dealing with the thoroughbred racing industry where weight is always a consideration um the method of shoeing we hope to th this method of shoeing we hope to sort of relieve some of that pressure on that dorsal hoof wall um, by graduating the foot by it's approximately two to three degrees uh, and this was in an attempt to try and re reduce some of that pressure uh, on the on the flexor unit uh, pulling on that coffin bone and stressing that laminal interface and here our main consideration was to try and keep this this horse was still in training we wanted to be able to keep a shoe on there whilst trying to address this 
um, dish in the dorsal hoof wall, which was becoming um, one um, quite a big concern in regards to keeping this horse sound, but also the aesthetics of it um, was not looking too healthy. So, so yeah, so that was why we opted for this slight graduation. Um, and why we wanted to then also pack that um, back half of the foot there. So we wanted to continue to load the heels. Um, so we were able to trim those heels down. We wanted to load those heels, uh, encouraging sort of weight sharing across the bars, the frog and the, pol uh, and the polymer sole region. Uh, and this will hopefully help to reduce that overall pressure upon the wall um, that we talked about in the, and, and, and I suppose it's believed that we could encourage the heels by encouraging the heels to be loaded. This may slow down the overall growth rate at the heels, um, adding to reducing that stress on the dorsal hoof wall. Uh, so, yeah, the dorsal region um, by increasing surface area that we're using. We, we've got that frog insert. Which we're, we're sharing load over greater surface area, therefore reducing pressure. Uh, and hopefully reducing that pressure around the toe margin and hopefully reversing that increasing or, or, or increasing the growth rate at the toe. So we can maybe restore some some better hoof uh, geometrics um, and maybe a uh, restore a normal functioning hoof mechanism. OK, so postural adaptation um, often postural adaptations are an indication of uh, asymmetries and can display with changes in stance uh, or even gait and performance often these um, high low horses these asymmetric horses develop asymmetries across the shoulders um, with changes in the angle of the scapula and I know you can't really see that here in these images uh, but you do tend to see this uh, angle change, this um, increase in mass on any particular shoulder. And it's often an attempt for that animal to try and correct that hoof and um, or, or those joint angulations. So sort of standing behind the horse and looking, looking over the back of the horse and at the shoulders, we can often give uh, or can often give um, this indication of a particular fuller shoulder appearance um, on any one side and it tends to be uh, on the flat foot side as that sort of scapula is rotating forward we often relate the scapular angle to hoof past an axis um, as, as, as both having a, a, a direct correlation to one another and we can see why that lower flatter foot having a sort of broken back hoof past an axis um, and we can see that um, with a more upright um, past an angle, we can understand why we would probably get that slightly rotating forward of the scapula and that fuller shoulder appearance. OK, so when we look at causes of um, hoof asymmetry, so some of the causes of these asymmetries um, are as follows, really. So we have lameness. Um, whether that's acute lameness or chronic lameness, um, we have trauma, and that can be, um, you know, during foaling, especially in in maiden mares, so so um, first time foals uh, from a mare who may occasionally have a slight difficulties with foaling. Um, direct trauma, um, direct trauma, so an acquired injury. Um, and that's trauma to tendons, ligaments, uh, or muscles. Repetitive training schedules and regimes. Um, working horses repeated, repeatedly on the same same rein, walking, training in the same direction, etc. Uh, rider imbalances. And it all has an effect on those that muscle development, um, and ultimately then. The, um, the relationship between that muscle, the tendon, and that skeletal frame. Uh, injury, uh, injuries often this can be uh, in the actual opposing limb, but lead to the flattening of the good foot as it bears that greater weight bearing responsibility. Uh, often this can lead to, um, you may have heard it, but um, supporting limb 
laminitis um, as a result. Um, but hoof imbalances, especially chronic imbalances uh, and improper shoeing, um, can also be a cause of hoof asymmetries. And again, it probably comes down to handedness uh, in ourselves as farriers, you know, predominantly uh, or, or having a dominance to to trimming styles or trimming protocols, depending on what foot we're, we're working on. Um, another cause I've got on the list there is uh, limb length disparity. So limb length disparities, I think it was a study by uh, Watson claimed that around 76 percent, 76 percent of thoroughbred racehorses have a slightly larger right third metacarpal bone, so our cannon bone. And often this sort of asymmetry would affect overall balance and condition of the animal. Um, we can also link limb length disparities to grazing habits and, and preferences at a young age, producing latra um, laterality, um, which is a dominance of one side of the brain in controlling particular activities or functions. Um, but I think actual research into limb length disparity and, and resultant uh, laterality has um, predominantly been carried out on on humans on on bipeds rather than uh, actual quadrupeds uh, or or horses. So yes, so it's it's still questionable, and I think ultimately um, there is no no definitive answer as in what actually causes hoof asymmetries. Um, one of the things I see, um, I see that um, as, 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 as with age, as horses get older, um, or as, as the work sort of increases, uh, or the, uh, the development of those animals uh, increases, whether that's um, building up muscle or, or, or just general aging, we tend to see this sort of um, slow progression and this um, these asymmetries becoming gradually worse okay so let us have a quick look at dr redding's grade of club foot um, dr redding grades club feet into four different categories um, and and grade one Oh, I'll actually say that we've said it before, but a, a club foot is a flexual deformity of the coffin joint and it results in this raised heel. Now, you could probably possibly argue that um, most hoof asymmetries are a level or a grade of club foot, especially on the, uh, the more upright foot. But again, um, it's, it would be very hard to apply that across the board. Uh, and it goes back to understanding the you know, the causes, the signs. Do we have a, uh, a flattening foot as a result of increased weight bearing due to uh, lameness or injury? Or do we have an actual grade of, of club foot where we are getting this this problem in the suspensions, suspension mechanism? Uh, or this this contraction or this flexural deformity um, of the coffin joint uh, or contraction of that muscular tenderness unit. So anyway, so a grade one um, hoof capsule three to five degrees greater than the opposing foot or that contralateral foot, um, and the pastern just begins to bulge forward. And you can see it on this this uh, image of, of of Dr. Reddin's here. So we've got a slightly increased hoof uh, hoof angle. Um, and this bulging here in the pastern area. So grade two. Um, grade two is very similar in, in, in angle to a grade one. However, in a grade two, we start to see growth rings begin to diverge. So similar to that case that we showed a few moments ago, where we have that sort of tightening of the growth rings around the dorsal toe area. And as we progressively get to the heels, we see that, that growth ring sort of increasing in its thickness. So we're getting this increased rate of growth at the heels compared to the toe and the, the, the palmar angle of the pedal bone is naturally a little higher due to that increase in heel growth. So moving on to a grade three, and you could possibly argue that the case we showed was between a grade two and a grade three as we um, a main difference in a grade three as we begin to get this dish at the toe. 
again we see a greater uh, growth ring divergence um, we definitely see a, a higher palmar angle uh, as we're having that more heel growth less toe growth uh, but what we're also starting to see now is a little bit of bone damage so a little bit of uh, p3 remodeling and then as we move on to a grade four um, the upper part of the of the hoof capsule um, so ignoring this dish but this upper part just below the coronary band we tend to sort of get in, we were starting to reach the 80 to 90 degrees with the ground becoming pretty much uh, upright uh, or as upright as it could be before um, the foot starts to knuckle over uh, and the heel is as high is as often as high um, as the coronary band so we have this sort of leveling of the coronary band here uh, this increase or this uh, rapid um, sorry, this 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 large heel height um, at the back of the foot um, due to those those sort of growth ring divergence, that rapid heel growth, the limited toe growth, um, and ultimately that increase in palmar angle. Okay, so we have a couple of case studies coming up. So this is a three-year-old thoroughbred racehorse in training, um, left four hoof angle at around about 48 degrees with a heel angle of 24 degrees approximately um, so this foot would would be our our our, um, our lower heeled um, hoof and the right four hoof angle being at 50 approximately 51 degrees with a heel angle of 35 degrees um, showcasing as our high heeled hoof so the difference between the hoof angle and the heel angle on the left four is approximately 20 24 degrees and the right four is around about 16 degrees so we're in the lower heeled hoof um or the low and the lower angled hoof we're actually seeing a greater difference between the toe angle and heel angle than what we are in the high heeled hoof um, which we're having a near uh, an 8 to 10 degree um, difference between the angle of both so so personally uh, the degree of hoof angle uh, variance at around three degrees is within a manageable range so we have we have a 51 degree and a 47 to 48 degree hoof so we are within that grade one um, club foot um, as, as, as Dr. Redden would, would classify it. Um, and as I said, it's, it's this manageable uh, variance of around three degrees that I would imagine if, if, we, if we measured, if we got more horses to stand on metron blocks and we took calibrated measurements, we would probably find uh, a lot more within this region. But the focus here with this particular horse is managing the heel collapse on the left fore um, but address the comfort of the right four in order to improve that stride length and overall balance of the animal in order to avoid preference over any one particular limb. Slightly different case here, we have a 12 year old dressage horse. So some of the initial things you can see is damage to the hoof wall. This doesn't look like an overly healthy hoof wall, whether that's the the uh, the upright heeled hoof on the left here or that lower heeled hoof on the right so the flatter lower heel angle foot here on the right uh, has slight doming of the dorsal hoof wall whilst the left side uh, foot shows slight curvature or concavity to that dorsal hoof wall and we do actually have it on this foot here at the very uh, at the very top here uh, but ultimately you can see how we're having that doming effect uh, whereas here we have this this very slight but evident um, dish to the to that hoof wall so the uh, the left fore hoof angle was at approximately 50 degrees with a heel angle of 42 degrees uh, and the right fore um, hoof angle at 46 degrees and a heel angle at 28 degrees so again we're seeing the difference between hoof angle and heel angle on the left four 
uh, as being 8 degrees and the right for um, at approximately 18 degrees. So again, we are around that 10 degree difference um, in that comparison. So another uh, young horse here, again, we have a two-year-old thoroughbred racehorse. So this was relatively freshly shod um, when these pictures were taken. Uh, and it was shod very traditional, uh, very standard sort of shoeing. I think this, this particular horse was shod with the same size um, shoes. And as you can see on that left fore, we have a little bit more uh, support around the heel margin. Um, than we do on the right four. Okay, so the left four hoof angle again on this particular case was around about 51 degrees uh, or 51 and a half degrees uh, and the heel angle was at approximately 45 degrees. So we've got a, a six degree difference between toe and heel angles. Uh, and then if we go to the right four, which would technically be our, our low heeled hoof, um, we have a hoof angle of 47 degrees and a heel angle of 33 degrees. So here we have a 14 degree difference. Again, we're falling into this category of between eight and 10 degrees uh, comparison between two feet. So what we're starting to see is some very interesting figures, some um, totally different horses. We've gone from a 12 year old dressage horse to a two year old. Uh, to a three or four year old in training. So we're seeing different scenarios, but we're seeing very similar figures here. Uh, but what is more apparent here is the uh, buckling of the dorsal hoof wall on that left four. So you can see this real exaggerated um, concavity, this curvature to the dorsal hoof wall. Uh, and what was also evident was that the left wall four was becoming more and more difficult to shoe. Um, possibly cannot see it here um, but these nails although they look um, they look to be um, you know there doesn't seem to be much wrong with them um, I was told that this horse was very difficult to shoe we were getting flattening of, uh, and thinning of the sole around the toe region um, which meant there was little to no vertical growth at the toe um, this meant that nailing became progressively more difficult whilst the horse was continuing to grow a tremendous amount of heel. And very quick, quickly we can fall into this spiralling situation leading to uh, a greater uh, or leading to greater difficulty and then uh, even possibly intermittent lameness. And you can actually see um, that this heel, although the foot was trimmed and the heels have been lowered, um, the application of a flat foot uh, or whether that is lowering that could have been uh, possibly a uh, trim level uh, with a shoe level but ultimately that horse is, is, is lifting up in that heel region there which is, um, which is an interesting observation. Okay. Okay, so if we look at the radiographs of this particular horse we can see the effects of that suspension component uh, upon that laminal bonding um, and the rotational force created, especially on the uh, on the high heeled hoof. So the high heeled hoof looks to have good um, hoof past and axis alignment, uh, albeit more upright than maybe we would normally uh, witness. So you can see why people would assume this was the more the, the, or the healthier foot. Um, displaying a more sort of desirable upright um, confirmation with a good straight hoof past an axis. Uh, however, um, that upright or more upright than usual hoof past an axis there is often an attempt to reduce the distance between the flexor muscle um, and the tendon with the insertion on the pedal bone um, and it does that by reducing the angle at which that tendon has to pass up the limb um, with a more with a, with a straighter or more upright hoof past the axis you reduce the distance um, between a and b or that insertion point up to the fetlock point which again acts as a fulcrum as that tendon then travels 
approximately up the back of the limb of the leg there. So when we look, uh, so with a low heeled hoof, um, however, that has a more of a broken back hoof past an axis, and you can quite easily again then see why uh, or where the thinking came from that would be to elevate the flat foot in an attempt to try and restore um, that hoof past an axis and, and, and try to impose a level of improved symmetry uh, about, uh, across contralateral feet. Um, but again, this this would merely be fulfilling the um, the aesthetic the aesthetics um, or the aesthetical appearance of these feet, uh, but not actually addressing the fundamental cause. We know that by elevating heels, we increase the time the heels are actually loaded, uh, and often delaying that enrollment phase. Um, so by just graduating the heels again, we are just Exa um, exacerbating that overall um, condition of what's actually causing this hoof asymmetry. So this is a great picture to just highlight both the support and suspension mechanisms again as we overlay that image onto um, one of these radiographs. But again, this is to try and stimulate this thought process that we must address the mechanics of the problem and not just focus on the support system. Um, certainly, please don't uh, misunderstand you know, what I'm saying here in this presentation. We must absolutely consider and shoe for the support mechanism, whether that's pads, packing, bar shoes, etc. But how... Uh, when and what to apply requires this more holistic approach to conditions like this, conditions like hoof asymmetries. Okay, so going back to the uh, original radiographs, and if we lay overlay those radiographs with the lateral images of the foot, you can see things a little more clearer. And this is the, the brilliance of Metron. Um, we recently invested in Metron um, as I am sort of hoping to do a study on um, on thoroughbred feet um, but ultimately you know just for tracking and, and monitoring your own your own work and, and, and the progression of horses feet when you apply different shoeing protocols is, 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 is a massive benefit to you as a farrier but also when trying to explain things to clients and owners and, and trainers. Uh, um, but yeah, so this is one of the features that if we're using calibrated blocks um, and taking x-rays on those blocks and also taking lateral, um, lateral photographs, we can overlay those images and really have a good thorough uh, look at what's going on here. So the right fore looks to have a longer toe and a low hoof wall angle. And this is emphasized by the sort of crushing of those heels and lowering of that palmer angle, that pedal angle, um, and that bro uh, broken back phalangeal alignment. Uh, we should also note the position of the center of rotation there uh, with that red dot and the green line. Uh, and then also notice that dorso palmar imbalance, balance, so that blue line. So when we ideally, if we go back to the foot mapping presentation, we're looking for this 50-50 split around the center of rotation. You can see how we have this massive dorso palmar imbalance. So with the left four, we can see a slightly more, um, we can see a much steeper, in fact, uh, pedal angle uh, with a greater palmer angle and also a dishing of that dorsal hoof wall so if we look at this white um, these two white lines here we can see that this is a quite exaggerated palmer angle of p3 uh, if we look at the uh, the blue lines here we can see how we're getting this dish and it tends to be sort of midway down that dorsal hoof wall uh, again this this is a thoroughbred so we already have minimal sole thickness i'm sure we can all relate to that um, but with that rotation of P3, we have even less sole thickness around that toe region. You can see how when you do get this, um, this pull, this steepening up 
of that pedal angle, this this uh, this increase, this steepening of the overall hoof past an axis, how we reduce our solar thickness here. And again, it's not directly um, the same as laminitis here where we're having um, rotation of that pedal bone about everything else we're actually having a, an increase in angle uh, an increase in palmar angle as a result of he excess heel growth and ultimately this this adaptation of the of the uh, the overall pastin being more upright so by pulling back the toe and lowering the heels you can see how this will increase the stress on that um, deep digital flexor tendon and exasperate this over this this total mechanism of of of, of the um, of what's actually happening. So again, we mentioned it before on the radiographs, but it's interesting to note that the that the hoof hoof past an axis on the high heel hoof and the broken back hoof past an axis on the low hoof low heeled hoof. It's not always a broken forward conformation in the high hoof like you may think. Um, in regard to this rotation of, 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 of P3 um, and instead more so due to the reasons as we uh, have previously discussed. But this goes back to some of our earlier observations when assessing for asymmetries uh, in those changes in posture controlled by the horse in, a, in an attempt to try and correct this issue. And it's this issue of contraction of that muscular tenderness unit and, and that pull that's placed upon that pedal bone. Okay, so Farrowy treatment uh, and corrective measures. So the key to managing odd feet is to keep each individual foot properly balanced. Um, odd sized feet often have an effect on the conformation of the whole horse and not just that of the lower limbs. For mild cases, um, Farrowy principles should be applied. You know, good Farrowy principles should always be applied, um, and that means just using good, you know, the hoof past an axis uh, as our reference. You know, using the center of rotation um, foot mapping uh, or good foot mapping protocols uh, for guiding both the trim and shoe placement, and also trimming of those heels to the widest and highest part or the plane of the frog. So not forgetting, you know, enhancing break over and reducing toe leverage. So good basic Farrowy principles um, will help to manage mild cases. As we move on to the more severe cases, often uh, we have to adopt a slightly different approach. And, and firstly, uh, and similarly to the uh, mild cases, good Farrowy principles, as I said, always apply. We should be mapping the foot in order to determine that center of rotation. We should be looking um, at the at the hoof past an axis again, uh, hoof geometry, toe and heel height ratios, uh, and where things start to slightly differ here uh, is is often in the trim or the trimming protocol. Um, we often do that from the center of rotation line back or palmarly, and it's one of and and why that's the case is is as we discussed in some of the signs is that we have very little or we often have very little hoof wall growth in that dorsal region we have very thinning or flattening of the sole so there tends to be little to no trimming requirements in the dorsal half so from that center of rotation back um, is where we are trimming and what we're doing we're trimming the heels to be on the same plane as the frog so again, we in our static examination, we're looking at the palmar aspect of those front feet. And then we, we talked about frog condition and overall frog health. The frog plays an incredibly important role in the in the in the, um, the hoof mechanism or the healthy hoof mechanism. And we must therefore, as we always do in good Farrowy practice, is look to encourage that frog to be involved in weight sharing and also the uh, the overall function of that foot in acting as that um, as that pump in order to pump blood around the foot that hydrostatic um, responsibility that it has so from the earlier examination you should have a good idea of the shape and position of that frog and the majority of the time uh, and the majority of the time on the ha on the height of those heels 
uh, and in relation to the frog whether that's slightly atrophied or recessed into the foot so this trim may sometimes require you to be a little bit more dramatic uh, it's important to load the palmar region for maximum support but you need to pay close attention to the amount of heel that you are trimming off or you are removing you can pop the foot down on the ground here and um, and th or even throughout and assess how that horse takes to the amount of heel that needs to be trimmed uh, and how much elevation if any um, those heels are from the ground sometimes people will recommend the use of a pad uh, placing a pad under the toe of the horse um, and depending on the thickness of that pad will dictate how much heel um, that you're able to then trim off depending on the comfort of that of that horse at the time so if there is space between the heel and the ground uh, this means that some form of elevation is needed and that it's and it is that that can be achieved in various ways that should we should consider um, you know not only as that support mechanism here but also for that suspension mechanism so by trimming palmally or, or, or in the back half of the foot from that center of rotation to the frog plane we are attempting to lower that palmar angle um, or that pa closer to zero with the hoof capsule so if we're trimming those heels down from that center of rotation back we are lowering that palmar angle uh, but we must then look to increase or restore that palmar angle back to that comfortable um, level in relation to the ground um, before when we looked at the x-ray and we see that this 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 horse was becoming more and more upright upright in its pastern upright in its its hoof angle um, with a great with a greater pa um, as a result of excess heel growth and this is uh, or resulting in excess heel growth um, so by trimming the heels down what we don't want to do is is lower those heels and leave them there and increase that stress that's placed or that tension that's placed on that muscular tenderness unit which is already contracting so by doing so we we could um, again exasperate that situation uh, it, it, it is this that is key here uh, and I really want to try and emphasize this point if you were to just lower the heels and ultimately lower the PA to the ground you will increase that tension on that suspension mechanism um, and you can quite easily find that you go back to that foot in in in, in two three four weeks um, and you are the same if not worse or in a worse position so some of the points we're trying to 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 achieve here is we want to increase the load um, support so we want to extend that base of support as palmarly as we possibly can uh, and we want to decrease the tendon pull by adding in some of those shoe mechanics and in time this will hopefully help to soften that muscle soften that pull from that muscle on the tendon and ultimately trying to rotate that pedal bone um, with inside the hoof capsule and hopefully if we can if we can soften that muscle and reduce that pull we can hope to get uh, an increase in sole thickness um, we can also uh, oh by loading the heels we can hopefully try and slow the uh, the growth rate at the heels and ultimately match that uh, at the toe and, and try and restore these overall hoof geometrics that we we spoke about earlier okay so here we have a good sort of visual representation of what that may look like and you can see how we try to attempt or um, to create a sort of zero pa or palmar angle with the overall hoof capsule if we look at those white lines on the image uh, and we're trying to do that without causing lameness or removing solar depth at that dorsal margin uh, gaining that zero pa uh, with the hoof whilst restoring a positive PA with that of the ground surface so if you look at those red hours we are red arrows we are removing heel and then again this is often from the widest part of that center of rotation that around that sort of um, 
widest part of the foot and then reapplying that um, heel elevation uh, with with shoe mechanics so making sure that we reduce breakover at the same time having a full emphasis on or encouraging breakover shall i say uh, and reducing that stress upon that deep digital flexor tendon during the enrollment phase um, so remember avoid trying to make the feet a pair this this can increase risk of lameness and instead shoe them both as individual feet avoid shoeing for uh, aesthetics rather than um, the real point here which is shoeing for the mechanics of what is happening so again we've got this sort of banana shaped shoe we've got this rocker shoe we've got the breakover mechanics into the shoe we've got this raised heel here and what you can see with the white line is we're seeing how we can take down our heels or trim from that red line so that center of rotation back in order to encourage uh, or extend that base of support load those heels um, share that load with the frog and ultimately lower that um, pa uh, within the hoof capsule creating that zero pa with the hoof but ultimately through the mechanics of the shoe raising that pa back to a comfortable position in order to try and help soften that deep flexor muscle so a great option for installing some mechanics into the foot uh, it doesn't always have to be as extreme as as the previous image uh, a great way to, to, to often do it is with um, you know your standard shoes or even some remedial types of shoes so we're looking here at the sound horse series one uh, Sigafu shoe uh, that was actually the Morrison roller motion shoe and you can see how it's got its built-in mechanics we have that sort of progressive um, well, that progressively rolled toe for enhancing breakover we've got that slight beveled heel uh, and what we've also got is around again around about a two to three degree elevation and this often depends on the overall shoe length um, the, 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 uh, how how these shoes are made that it, the greater the length of the shoe the actual higher that angle will be so um, some of the smaller sizes maybe the, the, the size that's on this particular foot here nine may be uh, an angle between three and four degrees but um, yes on average or your average size foot your sort of size four size fives um, you're looking at around about a two to three degree uh, elevation so the cuff allows for indirect glue uh, application and this reduces the the risk of fine nailing uh, whilst also adding um, tensile strength to the hoof wall by increasing that overall mass uh, and it, this is especially good for those feet that experience the damage to that toe and toe quarter region that we looked at a little earlier um, you know that's developed from that increase in um, in stress uh, whether that's toe first landing thinning of that of that hoof wall um, repet uh, shoeing where we're not getting any actual solar depth we're not getting any wall growth um, so we're seeing that deterioration of the condition of the horn um, so the Sigafu cuff um, allows you to rebuild strength in that hoof um, capsule giving that hoof capsule much stronger um, or, or an increased tensile strength in order to support um, the descending body weight so again uh, a brilliant shoe for for the application um, for this particular um, for the, this particular problem okay and finally we're looking at a case here of a four-year-old thoroughbred um, this particular horse um, we can see the image on the left hand side he had a 55 around about 55 degree toe angle he had a 33 and a half degree heel angle um, we use the direct glue shoe application um, here um, which is a, an application that um, glues directly to the the solar aspect of the foot focusing on the heels um, and you can see how uh, we had some uh, mechanics built into the shoe um, not as clear as I'd hoped um, in this image here because of the the lines from the Metron but you can see how we have the sort of beveling 
of the heel here and also rockering of the toe so we have this sort of banana effect on the ground surface of this particular shoe um, and he was trimmed from the center of rotation back to the widest part of the frog uh, and by doing that we were lowering those heels uh, it allowed us um, to to sorry lowering those heels allowed for the lowering of the overall hoof angle uh, that you can see we went from 55 to 52 um, so lowering that overall hoof angle by approximately three degrees uh, and which then allowed us to uh, also improve or increasing the heel angle by reducing its height and bringing it backward. So basic sort of trigonometry, um, we were lowering, uh, we increased that heel angle by reducing um, the base or, or extending that basal length of the foot. So although minor in the uh, extent of these alterations, you can see how we can manage this hoof and keep this horse as sound and as comfortable as possible. So it's a great example of how it's often about small and subtle tweaks uh, to just basic good farrowry that is key to managing a lot of these asymmetric horses. Okay, so to end, I would just like to quote um, Dr. Stephen O'Grady, um, Someone I've uh, I, I read a lot of his articles. I follow a lot of his work, along with um, Dr. Redden also. But um, to quote Stephen uh, O'Grady here, I would like to uh, you know he recommends good Farrery principles rather than any given methodology, uh, and he stresses the importance that each foot is addressed on an individual basis. Trying to match this type of foot confirmation, which does still occur, is unrealistic and potentially harmful to the horse so i want to say um thank you all uh, for listening today um i i certainly appreciate it um i hope you were able to learn something from it or at least it was uh, of interest to you so thank you all again and goodbye